Before we join my guest, a brief news report from the Texas Department of Parks and Wildlife. Like any 10-year-old, Hunter Johnson likes to play outdoors, but inside Hunter's body lurks a disease that sometimes stops him from doing normal kid stuff. Hunter has Lyme disease, an illness caused by a tick bite. In Texas, Lyme disease is most often transmitted through the Lone Star Tick, usually in its nymph stage. Tick season peaks between March and September. To prevent infection, avoid brushy areas and sitting on the ground. Walk in the center of hiking paths. Wear light-colored clothing that makes seeing attached ticks easier. Tuck your shirt into your pants and your pant legs into your socks to keep ticks out. Use an insect repellent containing DEET, do frequent tick checks while outdoors, and a full body check when you return inside. If you do find a tick on you or your pet, remove it carefully with tweezers. Wash your hands afterwards and disinfect the bite area. You can place the live tick in a small vial and take it to the Department of Health to be examined for bacteria. The faster you remove the tick, the less chance you have of contracting Lyme disease. But be aware of the symptoms. Flu-like symptoms, fever, headache, stiff neck, muscle aches, joint pain, with or without a rash. But if they get any of these symptoms anywhere from 3 to 30 days after tick bite, then they should see their physician as soon as possible. Tick-borne diseases in Texas uh, should not be a scary thing. You know, Lyme disease is our most prevalent tick-borne disease in the state, but again, we only have 50 to 100 cases per year uh, that are reported that meet our case definition. If a person knows all of these things and they encounter a tick, they'll know what to do, and they can they very likely prevent disease transmission and be healthy enough to enjoy the outdoors the next time. Hunter is doing better now, but he will probably have to monitor his disease for the rest of his life. I don't think I ever will, ever, totally get over it. Near Austin, this is Lydia Saldana reporting. My guest is Dr. Daniel Farb, a practicing ophthalmologist whose activities include e-learning, publishing, writing, and collaboration on hundreds of books and CDs. As CEO of the University of Healthcare and of the University of Business, he has developed many training programs on bioterrorism and authored over seven books on the topic, including Bioterrorism Certificate Program Manual and CD. Dr. Farb has been a researcher in Geneva, Switzerland with the World Health Organization and is a member of the American Association of Physicians and Surgeons. Welcome, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Hi, nice to be here. I want to know if we really have to be concerned about bioterrorism. How serious a threat is it and what really is it? Well, it's more serious than most people think and it's very important and most of us tend to forget about threats that seem distant but they're very active because uh, there are people in this world who are actively trying to develop uh, these sorts of diseases and these sorts of plans against us right now. How e easy is it to introduce a bacteria or virus to the human population here in the United States? Well, uh, let's concentrate on the seven deadliest diseases that the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, has identified. And those are the ones that I've written about in my books and CDs. Um, let's start with anthrax. Anthrax grows in soil all around the world. And we heard about this yeah. a few years ago when a post office was closed down and it took them three years to clean it up to open it again. Right. I think it just opened up recently. <laughs> And uh, I, I think one of the um, problems uh, with it is that it's so available. Now, it takes a little work to get it to the point where you can spread it through a post office, but still, it's readily available. Uh, plague, there are huge reservoirs of bubonic plague throughout the world. Wait, I think uh, of plague as something from the Middle Ages. <laughs> well, it's still with us, and it's still a very big threat right now. Same plague? Same plague, same organism is still with us. What carries it? Uh, well, rodents and fleas. Uh, but the problem is, is that with bioterrorism, you don't necessarily need the rodents and fleas any now, anymore. You just need, let's say, an airplane spraying an aerosol with uh, plague uh, germs uh, throughout a city, and you've got maybe tens of thousands of deaths uh, coming on the way. So it's not, 
it's not exactly middle-aged technology. Now, wait a minute. Uh, We're pet lovers in this country. Uh -huh. We have a lot of dogs and cats, uh -huh. and they seem to be carriers of fleas. I know I'm using my flea comb for my cat all the time. Am I in danger? Well, very little, but it has happened that dogs and cats and domestic animals have occasionally been the uh, medium for passing on plague to humans. But that's very rare. All of the occurrences we have in the U.S. of plague are very rare. There are rodents running around that have it, uh, but it, it's not something that's a day-to-day -day menace for most people. I think people who are out in rural areas, poor sanitation, and so forth have a little bit higher risk, but we can cuddle our pets. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. The the number of cases of diseases like plague and tularemia that you find each year are maybe 200 cases uh, per year. What exactly is tularemia? Not something in our common vocabulary. Uh, tularemia is a uh, bacteria that causes some severe sickness, and uh, nowadays we mostly get it by hunting if we're out hunting and sometimes skinning a carcass of an infected animal, something like that, or being in contact with rabbits or other kinds of outdoor animals. Uh, but again, what's scary about all this is not uh, the occasional contact that comes from uh, animals, and, and that is important to know about. And it's important because it helps one identify early on a case of bioterrorism, because if you see somebody that's not a hunter and lives in an urban environment, coming in with a problem uh, that is starting to look like anthrax or tularemia or plague, uh, your antennae have to be out for a bioterrorist attack. Are doctors uh, really alert and aware for some of these conditions? I'd say it's gotten better over the last few years, but in general, the state of preparation in our country is very poor, and uh, most medical professionals, uh, me doctors, nurses, emergency medical people, public health people, have very little knowledge of the specifics. You mentioned uh, seven. Let's name those so we okay. just are real clear okay. what they are. The seven most dangerous problems are anthrax, botulinum, uh, hemorrhagic fever viruses, uh, plague, radiation, smallpox, and tularemia. Okay, so six of those seven are living organisms, really, bacteria and viruses are live. Radiation, that comes from x-rays. Uh, right, and one of the scary things about it is that you can even make a dirty bomb using some explosive and adding on, uh, let's say, some radioactive material that you've obtained through, let's say, working in a medical lab or something like that. Because the idea of a dirty bomb is that it spreads some radioactivity and some contamination and causes some degree of panic, uh, the increase in cancer risk from something like that would be rather minor. Um, it's more a panic type of thing. What's really scary, of course, is the possibility that there are suitcase bombs that the Soviets developed that have been purchased by countries or individuals who have a real interest in using them. Do we have to worry about food contamination? Well, currently there's no problem. Uh, if you were living in the Soviet Union in the area of Chernobyl, which is where that big reactor uh, leaked out radiation into the environment a number of years ago. In the ago, Ukraine. In the Ukraine. Um, that has caused lots of problems and increased cancer risk and so forth for the people there. Now, a bioterrorist attack uh, could cause a similar kind of thing. If they flew a plane into a nuclear plant or if they found a bomb they could blow up, it would be like Hiroshima or Nagasaki all over again, and you'd have uh, all the problems that came along with it, all the genetic.